Hi, Liz. Oh, hi. Ah, sorry, I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> I was thinking it was from my side, so I'm really struggling to find out what oh, you okay. How are ah, you? Okay, I'm fine, and you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, let I'm me just... joining on audio. I don't want to join on video because I'm not photogenically correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, Vicky, you need to you need to check your please. Let me just tell Vicky, please mm -hmm. check your what is it called? Your mic? audio. Uh, audio, audio. I'm using this thing for the first time. I've never used it before. Ah, me, I left Skype. Let me not teach you. Skype used to get into my nerves completely. So. Uh, and this is uh, better? Yeah, this is much better. And you know, I'm recording as well. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so then I can even uh, upload it. Later. Use it for the future. Yeah. I can upload it and then go do, uh, do some editing and, you know, stuff like that. Ah, you okay, know. cool. Yeah add in uh you know like if there's a website you can add it in or something like that mm -hmm. um, jill i can hear joy okay um but vicky we can't hear you ah you you've got your audio out you she's i'm just seeing that she's got her audio out. Well, she has to press that audio because I had to press yeah. it like twice for then it worked. It has worked now. She's on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Sorry yeah. about that. No, it's all right. Um, so Jill, we have um a friend of mine, Jill. Uh, sorry, Vicky, we have a friend of mine, Jill, who is on, mm -hmm. who, who will also want to be doing some contributions. Uh, hi Vicky. Hi Jill, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Good. Sorry about the best thing about. No, that's all right. Um, so what I was going to say is that we still go by our program, uh, the way we had planned. You're with me? Yep. Yes. For me, I'll just listen into it. And then if I have any questions, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that, 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 that would be perfect. Um, so um, we start off, Vicky. Uh, where are we starting? Did I miss anything? No, no, we've not started. We were waiting for you actually to, you know. Okay, all right, yeah. okay. So, yeah. um, so we'll... maybe we just start like, like we said, you know, we first start with the right from the beginning, uh, in the introductions. Okay, yeah, okay, so... okay, so okay. So okay, um, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, you, Vicky, uh, to to these uh, discussions. What I've called actually critical whiteness, because we're going to be doing regular topics uh, on this top on on this subject. And the reason why I needed to have uh, somebody to discuss critical whiteness is that uh, I have a lot of people that are coming over to me that would like to really understand what is this uh, white privilege, critical whiteness. So um, in, in trying to find a place where to start, I thought we start from the right from the beginning, which is the topic of today. Uh, why do white people have problems, you know, why do white people have problems or consider that when we're talking about racism, they tend to think we are suffering from uh, paranoia. Uh, so that would be what we're going to be talking about today, but that is just the topic and around that topic is what I'd like us to hold these discussions about. Uh, but before we move on to the topic, I'd like us to do some self introductions, um, which I'd first of all like to give the floor to you, Vicky, to introduce yourself. Okay, well, uh, I'm Victoria, but uh, I go by Vicky with most people. And uh, years ago, I was doing church Church related community work with homeless and uh, with homeless people and with people seeking asylum. When I stumbled into having to shift focus from my usual line of work to challenge systematic racism. So, four years ago, um, 2016, I set up my own organization and it's called the Project Esperanza. 
uh, whose purpose was to deliver domestic violence and abuse support to the African community. And again, within that work, I found myself having to challenge systematic oppression and such issues. So um, in a nutshell, let's just say I've done this work for about eight years. Oh, your mic is gone. Your mic is gone. Yeah, has it gone again? <laughs> now it's back. Now okay. I can hear you. Yeah. So um, outside of that, um, I, I've just finished writing a book that will soon be published. And in that book, I use my experience of working within the community and also my own life experiences to explore issues of race, migration, and integration. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, on my side, I am a diversity and communication management trainer, and I recently took up the uh, uh, doing workshops related to critical whiteness or white privilege, uh, where I offer two different varieties of workshop. That one, first one, would be for the basic, uh, for the new beginners who have not been, who have done absolutely no thoughts on what is racism and would like to get more information or to be synthesized. Uh, on racism and white privilege. And then uh, the other one, that the events that we're going to be doing together with Vicky, both on this side of the continent and in Great Britain, uh, is to be hosting what we're going to be calling uh, the Race Think Dinners. Uh, this one is going to be limited to people who have actually given thoughts and have done some analysis on the topics of, of racism and would like to find out for themselves more and to get themselves more uh more um you know informed uh, as to where are those mind fields or where are those minds that they can be able to avoid and also to be able to uh, just live a normal life instead of feeling like they're walking on eggshells all the time so that is the one that i do and of course the cross cultural trainings which I offer, which of course then blends for me very well with the critical whiteness, uh, because basically I train people that are going out again into those uh, areas where white privilege is an issue. So that was why, uh, you know, I, I decided to take up the topic and blend it that way. So, um, Vicky, we agreed that we would like to start right from the roots, and that is the historical uh, background on the discussions around racism um uh, most interesting is that when i read the book of um of uh rennie uh Ido, uh lodge why i'm not talking about uh, why i'm not talking about race to white people is uh she really started on the roots which which was you know like something that mirror matched how i begin and uh it's interesting to note that there is a, uh, one of the biggest slave trade ports actually in Liverpool. I did not know that. I mean, I've been to England and to the UK for so many times, and I did know that, that there was a, a slave uh, you know, market and a slave storage, like the way that you'd call it, the black cattle market, uh, one of the largest that there is a museum in uh, Liverpool. Did you know that? Yes, I did know that. Um, the UK has... Uh quite a shameful history uh, with slavery, even though it, it, it's got that part, the positive part of it that says they have a lot to do with abolishing slavery. You know, um, a huge part of their history was to do with the slave trade, unfortunately. And yes, the next time you're here in England, we'll go to Liverpool. It's, you know, it's a, a nice place to visit. The museum's very nice. It's very informative. Uh, you'll you'll re you'll learn a lot of things that you know you, you just didn't imagine were happening around these parts of the world you know to do with the uh, black people being brought over from um africa to to work so for white yeah. people bristol uh, is also another part of the country that uh has a huge history with slavery but you know when you come we'll make time to go to all those places Definitely. Uh, you, you've just brought in a very interesting uh, word there, abolishing slave trade. And this actually brings me back to whitewashing, you know, informations that we experience all the time when we're talking about racism. Uh, because uh, if you look at the history, actually, of racism, uh, of, of slave trade, if I may just go back there, is that um, British people did not actually abolish. They got compensated 
for the black cat losses. Not, not only did they have insurances against, you know, losses of those uh, human being or black cat, like they called it, they would get compensations in terms of they had taken an insurance, but for them to have abolished the slave trade, then it was an agreement that they would get compensations and to balance their books, you know, like as in profit and loss. So uh, it was actually not, you know, these are the things that I really consider as whitewashing, you know, for whose convenience is it being now being done for us to think, oh, thank you very much that you are so considerate enough to set us free, but without nothing in our hands. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you got, not only got money to get uh, workforce, year long, all, the t all those years, 600 years that we've been talking about slave trade, you got compensated and uh, also managed to balance your books so that there was no losses. So yeah. uh, that's what I found very interesting. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, they compensated slave owners, but uh, didn't do anything about uh, compensating, you know, slaves and, um, you know, their families. And uh, this is an ongoing debate that's happening even um, in America where, um, you know, Americans are asking for reparations, you know, and, and, and I do believe in this country uh, there's some groups of uh, black people asking for um you know, it, the UK to uh, do something about in the in the way of payment for um, the situation that you've described. So yes, very right. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we wanted to look about was also to look about talk about um, the forms of racism, which uh, you wanted to give us first of all some bit of a background uh, on before we know we're going to because most people really. Uh, have uh, this black, a real black and white view on what is racism, but racism is deep. Yes, yes, you're right. So, um, you know, I'll just touch on it very quickly because I'm aware that our next session is based purely around um, talking about racism and yes. giving the, the definitions. But I'll just skim quickly past through the five main ones, which are individual racism, uh, this interpersonal racism. There's institutional racism, which is the main type that most of us non-Europeans will encounter when we migrate, you know, yes. whether it's from Africa or wherever we come from, to live in places that are not home. There's cultural racism, uh, and then there's also uh, structural and systematic racism, and that's also another common type, you know, and, you know, like I said, we'll go in depth with all of those forms at the next session. Yes. When I when I think about the different forms of racism, I also have uh, what I, I think we are going to really get into deep is also just why is why do we have uh, racism? I now came across a video where a child, a white child, was asking asking a black man, "Why are you why are you black? Why do people say that you're black?" You know, so. Um, in that in that next section, we need to look at and also address such things like where where are the origins? Because when you talk about racism, we're not talking about uh, something that is inherited in terms of DNA. We're talking about behaviors that have been inherited from from where we are taking it back in our next uh, sessions of uh, critical race think back to the table dining tables where where this is being you know spoken about freely and also discussed on which strategies they're going to be dealing with people of other colors and also the the uh, for me i came to find out that actually we blacks or other people never considered ourselves to have any color but the the color issue was actually something that the whites needed yeah. to be able as living at that time needed to to classify themselves to be more superior this yeah. uh, the urge to feel I am more superior, I know more, I get more, I am I am entitled to more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Um, I mean, if if I can just say that uh, I came to Europe in my teens, you know, and uh, the first country I arrived at was uh, Germany because I had family living there, and uh, <laughs> uh, I lived in Berlin for um, some time, and. Uh, that was over 25 years ago. And at that time, you know, the scenario then wasn't the way it is now. You know, there were very few black people and um, 
I had situations where I'd step out onto the street and, you know, and this may be common for a lot of people, you know, depending on where you live in Germany. And people would actually stop me and mainly old people, you know, yeah. stop me. They want to touch my hair. They want to feel my skin. Um, they want to take a picture or, you know, their children or their grandchildren are inquiring about the way I look and they just want to take a minute to, to, um, to talk, you know, or maybe to find out if I can actually speak. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, there's two sides to it. You know, there's that racism that, you know, people do unknowingly, you know, it, it's just one of these ignorant things. And, and maybe that comes out of uh, a sense of curiosity, but, you know, it's also racist. Uh, and I just feel like uh, people that are at that place where, you know, they need to inquire by touching and, and taking pictures and all that sort of thing. I mean, I had somebody that said the closest they'd ever seen to a black person was, um, you know, on the TV, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, even, and even when I came to Scotland, I, I, I had issues of, uh, you know, people describing my children, you know, saying my children look like certain people and all this sort of stuff. And um, I just think that, uh, you know, it, it's on the shoulders of white folks to do their own research around the curiosities that they have, you know. Um, and yes, it is rude, and some people may not have a problem with it, but it's quite invasive. You know, you step out of your house, you're trying to have a quiet walk, or, you know, you're in your own thoughts, and there's these invasions and interruptions of how your day goes because someone is curious um, yeah. about your blackness. It, it, it's a mild form of racism, you know. Um, it, it, it's a mild form of racism. But, um, you know, the, and then there's, there's a situation of um, when we have encountered what we have encountered coming to Europe, you know, and, and you know, you try to talk about it or you try to give the education, so to speak. You know, um, and, and sometimes education comes through discussion. You know, yes. and um, you you have people that will often say, um, or, or, or rather, I'll ask this question: So, how often have you been told by a white person that you're being irrational whenever you try to raise these issues? You know, um, or that you're overreacting. So, when you're yeah. trying to speak of your experiences, like the experience I just described, you know, and I'm trying to express how impolite it is and how ignorant it is. You know, I've been told that. I've been told I'm uh, uh, being over, I'm overreacting. I'm overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, and you get, oh, stop being so sensitive, you know, or you're too emotional and, you know, it's not that deep or uh, you're always jumping to the wrong conclusion. So instead of, you know, having that dialogue where I can be understood or my point of view can be understood, I get, a form of attack, you know, um, you know, and, and the worst I've ever got is, you know, um, why would you think that way? And so if you think that way, what does that say about you? You know, yes. Oh, yes. And, and so uh, most black people would have been in this sort of situation. And it's one of those scenarios that needs to be stopped by conversations around such behaviors by white people impact mental health because it's a big thing and, and, and you know, most people don't realize it, you know. Um, this form of, uh, this behavior is a form of psychological abuse, yes. you know. Yes, yes. In, in which the abuser in this scenario is a white person, you know, and, and, and then they try to deny your reality, you know, and that in other terms is known as uh, gaslighting, you know. <laughs> oh, so when, yeah. <laughs> when they do all that, oh, you're overreacting and it's not even like that and all of this, they're changing your narrative to suit themselves, you know, or yeah. to make themselves comfortable, you know, uh, or maybe it's a defense mechanism for them. I don't know, you know, but. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah the defense mechanism is the one that I always find uh, comes over. Um, I don't see color. For me, everybody is, you know, um, it, 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 you know, it, this is what really, uh, you know, kind of like drains me that, um, that first of all, they are the ones that are always going to say, I've never heard an African or a black person say, I don't see color. Yeah. 
Um, I like the way Jane Elliott attacks it. I, uh, Jane Elliott, the, the, the one that came up with the concept blue eye, brown eye, in which she says that uh, you cannot say that you don't see that there is um, a, a difference between a man and a woman, you yeah. know? Those are differences that you cannot say that suddenly everybody is standing there, even the trees, even the plants, even the whatever, they have their differences. So if you come and you tell me, I don't see color, is again, another way of telling me, um, now you deal with it. We want to get over this racism. This is my method of dealing with it. I don't see color and this is it. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and, and in those instances, you'd find that people like that would normally teach their children or their grandchildren color. So if they go back home, they're not going to tell their daughter that or their grandchild that, oh, the lady next door, you know, who has no color, they yeah. will see this black lady next door, you know. And then you, you also have that thing where, you know, children act out what they're taught. Yes. You know? yes. So uh, then you, you've got that thing where kids learn from what we teach them so kids hear black people this and black people that and they take it outside your front door and use it to victimize people I mean when I came to live in Scotland um, you know my daughter was seven at the time and she didn't even know she was a black person and oh yeah someone oh, yeah. actually pointed it out to her you know my son as well you know and that was you know I mean she is black you know she's got the same color skin as me but you know talking in those terms was never a thing so that unpacked a whole other thing where you know part of being a black mother and and, and being a black parent is having to sit down with your child to have these sort of conversations around when you live in white environments you will get people that will single you out because you have darker skin or you have you know different kind of hair or whatever and you know Talking to a six-year-old or a seven-year-old about such things is, is very difficult, as you may know, uh, you know, if you've got young kids. But yeah, like I said, these are learned behaviors. You know, kids go to school, they see a child that looks different to them. They know this child is black, you know, but when you confront the parents, the parents will tell you this thing that you're saying that actually, I don't see color, you know. So if you don't see color, how has your child, you know, attacked Us? my child? Yeah. on the basis of the color of color yeah you know yeah, exactly so, so it, it's those sort of things that we encounter i and remember you know, I, came, I i came to germany 30 years ago and uh in a villa in a in a town of 250,000 uh population we were about i would say we were at the most five people uh one was coming from tanzania myself from kenya i think we were two three people coming from kenya from south you africa and the scenario that i've described and I had my son and um, I had real big difficulties because I have the background that I know my history. I was taught the history and I also took time to learn more about, you know, the history. And I could see that this was affecting my son. I, at that time, I had not done this cross-cultural training, so I did not have those tools. But I knew that there was something that I needed to do for my son because those days uh, images of black people were not being seen on television on media and on mainstream as a matter of fact there's a friend of mine who came and uh, she was uh, she came in and she said she was a, a model and she wanted to continue to do her model jobs here in Germany and when we went for the first time in this agency uh, the person told us you cannot be able to make people bear the sight of seeing a black person right. on, on TV. And that is when I decided to put, uh, you know, to just, to, to encourage and to give my son more confidence, we started to do the history of Africa. My yeah. son did the history of Africa from Mauritania to South Africa, you know, <laughs> so many yeah. ethnic groups. And, we, and I brought back, I brought back uh, uh, the, the literatures that we had any literature that I could find in English and German uh, that was written and I could verify the, the you know, the content of the, in, the content, I would, we would sit down. My son had read Things Fall Apart, Lion and the Jewel, you name it, he did yeah. it. And uh, I, I think even in our third next uh, version of, of, of these discussions, it's also going to be talking about how African parents are neglecting in the diaspora to talk about this with their children. Yes, that's no. right. Right. This, this history is completely missing. And when you look at, um, I was traveling once from, uh, 
from uh, Amsterdam to Newcastle, we're going to, to Edinburgh. And uh, I, I don't know how the conversations came. It was all around Brexit, though. Uh, this young guy tells me, it could be more than 20, 30, tells me, oh, you speak very good English. And then I tell him, uh, yeah, but you know, you colonized us. He says nothing like that. We've never been, okay. we've never colonized anybody. We, but Great Britain doesn't do things like that. Okay. No, got me curious to find out, and I came to really find out that in the British in the British school system, and also there was this uh, author that also said that in the British education system, colonization does not come out in the format that it was. It has been whitewashed. Yes, that's right. I came and I, I found out, I gave you already that small little text, which I found in Instagram, where yeah. this lady came to find out about uh, in, uh, in Saxon and Hessen, how children are being taught about how to mirror match nigger nose, this yeah. and that, right yeah. in this day, you know, in this year and century. I mean, yeah. we need to, we, we as the parents that have those children, I think it is our responsibility also to get to the mainstream and to get that corrected, not just accept it as, okay, you know, that is what they've written. Because fact is, racism is something that we are also supporting when we don't do anything about it. You're right, you're absolutely right. And I mean, that one is a very sore one because uh, it's, a, it's a painful one because like I said, I've had children in this country mm -hmm. and you know, they've been gone to school in this country. And you know, when they come home with homework around David Livingston and Cecil John Rhodes and <laughs> and you know she's sitting there doing a homework or she wants to talk about it to tell to show me how well versed she is in, in yes. this topic and I keep correcting her and telling her actually that's wrong that's wrong that's wrong yeah. these yeah. men were not heroes you know and all that sort of stuff and um, yes uh, the, the curriculum in this country doesn't teach much about actually nothing around empire and colonization mm -hmm. nothing of the sort and uh, we're getting to a place now where it's you know the discussions are being had and uh, hopefully in time to come we will see this uh, subject introduced in, in schools I mean I for one would definitely like, like love to um, see my children learn that but you know if they're not teaching that in mainstream schools it doesn't mean us as parents, you know, we don't leave it to other people to educate our kids. We can do the work ourselves, yes. you know, and bring that uh, education and awareness to our own children. If, if the systems refuse um, to allow such education to happen in the classroom, you know, and, and th that's part of what you're saying that, you know, it, it's also our responsibility in not doing anything about it. We're complicit, you know, yeah, we're, we're with complicit. these systems. Yeah, with these racist systems. So I totally agree with you. You know, I totally agree. And uh, now I know that you 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 get, you wanted us to get off in twenty minutes. Just give me a heads up when when it has to happen. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So whilst we're still on the subject of you know uh, being gaslighted, you know, I, I think we kind of like drifted off. You know, I just wanted to say that you know I always like to urge people, you know, in the community, black people in the community, to think about some of the ways that they're black experience has been minimized by a white person, you know, and whether or not they've been gaslighted, you know, these are things you need to constantly think about when you raise an issue with a white person and, you know, you need to look out for their responses, for their answers, yeah. or, you know, those things are important, you know, those things are important because sometimes I think we have been um, naive to think that we have friends. You know, even even people you go out with for a coffee can have very disgusting views, you know, and these are people, you know, you've had friendships with over the years because you've lived in the same communities, you take the kids to school together, or, you know, you're in one club or the other together, or you go to the gym together, and you may think these people are your friends, but you, you will only truly know who your friends are, depending on you know, how they view your experience as a black person. And also that's not enough, you know, what it is they do, you know, to make your experience as a black person living in a country that's not yours bearable. You yes. know? Um, so in my, in my uh, line of work, I found that whenever uh, black women like myself talk about the issues that are specific to us, you know, uh, we're ignored as the first reaction. You know, 
we're told that we don't know our place in some instances. You know, we get too big for our boots. We're also accused of being divisive, we're being aggressive, we're mannerless, we're mean, and so on and so forth, you know. And I can remember a time when my, my white friends, in and outside of the church, you know, because I worked in the church, you know, began to distance themselves from me when I started advocating for the black community, you know. Yeah. Black empowerment and speaking about institutional and structural racism, you know, spoken about discrimination and exclusion and other such issues that affect black women and black families, you know. People just weren't comfortable to have those discussions. And the easiest thing to do when you're not comfortable is just do away with that person, you know. And to be honest, you know, this gaslighting issue, it's not just down to, um, it's not just down to white people, you know, but sometimes as well, you know, uh, black people do it too, you know, uh, you know, black people do it to each other, you know, I've, I've been around black people that, you know, tell me, come on, it's, it's, get on with your life, just go to work, get your money, pay your bills, you know, live your life, you know, don't focus too much on that because it's negative, you know, uh, my children are never going back to Africa, you know, I mean, they'll visit, they'll, uh, but home is here, so I need to speak about these things because I need to create um, a better tomorrow yeah. for my children who don't necessarily view Africa as the place that they'll spend the rest of their lives, you know, they know they're from there, they visit there, but in terms of getting jobs and finding life partners and whatnot, I think it will happen in these environments. And so it's my responsibility, you know, to make sure I at least do something, you know, about getting things right. You know, some of my black friends have phoned me or messaged me, you know, giving me what they consider to be advice, you know, and, you know, they've said, I've, you know, I've been unfriendly, I've been hostile, I've been yes. right. I need yes. to tone down, you know, the way I speak. They've tried to discourage me from my manner of addressing these issues, you know. And upon failing to discourage me, you know, they've settled to label me as selfish, I'm dominant, I'm pushy, I'm aggressive, you know, I'm controlling, I'm stubborn, and, and so on and so forth, you know. But, you know, uh, fortunately for me, I'm, you know, I'm no longer a stranger to people being upset with me. Or walking away from me, from me for being, you know, for taking my stance on race and equality issues because I've had that experience constantly ever since I started advocating for the black community and the work that I do. I've lost some people that I consider to be friends, and you know, I've had to redefine and reevaluate some of the relationships that I have left. Yeah, you but know? when you're talking about that uh, on us as Africans, um, particularly if, like, the last time we were having these conversations. Uh, when you're married to a white person, there comes that issue of, and uh, how can you be uh, advocating against uh, racial discrimination, and yet you are married to a white. Yeah. Um, um, what I've come to really realize is that our thinking, our way of thinking is that we too are implicit to the, we, we bought in on the race, on the race issue, yeah. uh, which basically means that you look at your husband, you don't see a human being, you're seeing, for myself, you're seeing a race. Yeah. Whereas I am a person who has been qualified and trained. I can be able to see a human being. Yeah. And, the, and I can be able to see that I'm black and he's white, according, yeah. to, according to the definitions of 1833 that was brought to classify us between black and white. Yeah. I am not uh, saying that I agree to it, but it is there and that is why we are, we are here uh, and that is why we're having these conversations. Yeah. Now, when I look at how Blacks are, when, when they are married to a white, they feel they are being disloyal when they start to talk about right. racism. Yeah. So it's because they have not been able to engage or to analyze exactly what is it that we're talking about when we're talking about racism. You see, racism is a political structure, and yeah. that is what we're talking about it. Yeah. We're not talking about the DNA of a human being. We're talking about prejudice is equal to race, and that is a political structure. Yeah. Bias, prejudice equals to this structure that has been put up uh, in, in forms of uh, differentiating the, pr the privileges that who is entitled to what. And that is yeah. how I look at my marriage. 
It is not a marriage of he, he is white and I am black, but does he know what privileges he has? Yes, because I remember an incident where I was telling my husband, when we go out together, me and him together, everybody is seeing that's a couple. But when yeah. I go out myself, and I'm like, for instance, going into a shopping center, and I go and I touch a piece of, no, I see some t-shirts piled nicely. I go and look at them and I say, hmm, maybe I wasn't really going to buy them. And I look, oh, the colors are beautiful. Let me touch the texture. I go and I touch the texture huh. and I can see from the corner of my eye, behind you. she is standing there, the white, that white sales lady, standing there looking pretty nervous because for the longest period of time, I was never doing shopping in Germany. I had enough of this. I could never understand, I could never dock it, what is going on here. So I can see that I'm going to touch that. Then I did the experiment, I'm going to touch that. I touch it and I move over and I can see that she goes very fast back, takes what I touch, put it at the bottom yes. and puts the right, and you know, puts them back into a neat pile. I waited and the next white woman did exactly what I did. Nothing happened. As a matter of fact, she came in and she was all, she was the rainbow itself, talking very, very well to this lady. And, you know, and for me, I gained my shadow in the form of the security. It was yeah. following me everywhere. So yeah. when I look at, uh, when I look at uh, racism, I look at the political structures it's coming with. Right. For me, racism is a political structure. It is a structure that needs us to be there where we are and them the others who consider to be superior to be there where they are and to enjoy those privileges. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that you've said that, you know, because um, when I've spoken about uh, other black people, gaslighting black people, talking about race, in my experience, it has normally been white, it's normally been black women that are married to white men. And, and, and I don't know if that's a, a psychological thing to defend their partners, you know, but my husband's not like this, but my husband's great. Yes. And what it is, is, you know, when we're speaking about these issues, like you say, we're not discussing your husband. No. We're discussing a structure. We're discussing a system, you know, yes. and it's nice that your husband's an individual and he's great and he's not racist, but, you know, that's not what we're bringing to the table. And I do wish that some of our sisters that are married to um, white people, uh, would be able to be open-minded enough to separate the two. You know, yes. what happens at home, under your roof, behind your closed doors, you know, that's nice, that's great. But when you step out into the world, you know, how does racism affect even you that's married to a white person? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and people seem to be closed-minded around that. They want to close their ears around that issue. They want to shut their eyes around that issue. It's not up for discussion no one wants to talk about it you know they'd rather go oh you know but not all white people are like that and this is not about white people this is about a structure yeah yeah, yeah. a political structure um yeah. when we need to or if i can just try and sum it up we really need to have these conversations on running on two on two types of rails one yeah help I, I i don't want to say i want to help white people understand white privilege i want to challenge them to, to do to, the work to do the work. I want yeah. critical discussions around white privilege. Uh, but on the other side, I also would like to see that that uh, people who are, you know, who are uh, of my color or of my race of, or whatever you want to call it, too, are challenging and are ch uh, challenging themselves to have yeah. such discussions on what is white privilege and what is. Because if we're not doing that, some of us have boys. I have a boy, black right yeah i have a black son too yeah so the, the 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 gender experience of racism for the male black is really much much um painful that we women would go out as tokens of yeah. the racism we're good to look at if we've got a good figure we you know yeah. those pass around and because depending on how <laughs> yeah. we are the decorations we you know could hang us on the wall or whatever but yeah for for uh, in the political structure of racism the male black is a threat of course he's a threat and the sooner particularly mothers the sooner that they realize this they are going to be the advocates of making sure that we try to we, we endeavor 
in whichever generation we are in to break the system. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So I wanted us to go into uh, uh, the discussions of a brief discussion of our future uh, race think dinner, where we are going to be bringing in uh, people who have already read the two books. You remember the ones that we're talking about? I don't yes. want to reveal them here because they, they, these books are going to be the condition for them to, uh, to attend such an event. Yes. So I just wanted us to kind of like give little impulse as to who are those people who are going to be kind of like allowed or would be uh, qualifying to attend uh, a race think dinner uh -huh. and uh, what would they be expecting? So I, I'm going to just start off because uh, I think I kind of like uh, came across this concept. I, I, I am tired of bringing uh, another workshop. Um, another seminar, another conference, yeah. or another whatever. So, and I'm also known to use the un uh, unusual or unorthodox or whatever you want to call it methods, where I tend to think that if we're talking about racial discrimination, privilege, white privilege, these discussions mainly take place on dining tables. Yeah. And I think that is where we need to take back these discussions. Yeah. back to the dining table and that is why i came up with the idea of doing the race think dinner thinking about race and talking about it where we are going to be working together to just make sure that uh the participants that are coming in who have attended a critical work work critical whiteness workshop huh. come to attend the race think dinners to just go into much depth as to what are these structures doing how are they how are they complicit to it and what can they do and what do they want to do themselves because like i said breaking we were never the architects of racism uh -huh. so we have to take the the we have to take back the problem to the architects of course yes yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so so um um again can you be clear on this race thing dinner is it just mainly white women you're bringing or can it be white men too they're going to be white men and women, although I'm just having some bit of issues as to the dynamics that are going to be playing between the male, the male white superior and the, fe the women feminisms. Because these, again, are two consolations that most likely could not be compatible with one another when, we, when we're saying, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but nonetheless, the initial one, it is going to be a mixed one. But I will still have a good uh, view on looking at the the male uh, white synergies as well as those female. So that is going to be white people coming to these dinners, uh, white people that have read the books that are going to be the 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 the, the, the structure you know that is going to be for for running the this dinner event. And I'm also going to bring in. Uh, let me just say people of color who uh, participants as people of color a male and a female well, that are going to be people of color well uh, somebody who is black somebody who is african somebody who is a mixed race um i'm not going to i'm not going to uh, go into um because the pain is the same for as far as i'm concerned oh yeah yeah so i'm going to bring a participant that is going to uh, to uh, give the impulse to the white people so that they can listen from the horse's mouth, as it's called, what are those experiences these people have when, when they are you know, moving around or when they are enjoying the, the political structures that has been put up to, to, for their advantage and for our disadvantage. Yeah, um, I, I think it'll be an, 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 in, an in, interesting one to have both white men and white women there because I personally feel like uh, white feminism and the patriarchy go hand in hand in terms of uh, how we experience life as black women because uh, i'll give you an example from the angle of black motherhood you know uh, if we take away the, the structures that are already there you know that prevents us from having good jobs or good education or good housing or good medical care or even status to live in a country there's these many structures you know that you know that there's these many structures on on the other end of those many structures are white women who decide 
whether or not we keep our children or whether our children go into oh, yes. okay. whether or not our children are good in you know uh, classes top students whether or not our children are viewed as you know high achievers you know so on the other end of how we experience life as black women or black mothers you know is a white woman making a decision even in a hospital where you're giving birth yes. you know it'll be a white woman that will decide how that birth will go you know how your experience birthing your child will go you know whether good or bad you know um and 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 oftentimes when black women speak about the issues they've had with maybe say social welfare coming to get their kids or them needing to attend a certain program because they have not parented their children the appropriate way or the subscribed mm. way and all this, it's normally a white woman at the end at the top. yes of that mm. issue so uh yeah that you're bringing men and women together to have this discussion would be very interesting you know yeah, yeah. Be very I would definitely like to be the fly on the wall. <laughs> we are. We're going to manage room. this. Yes. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much, Vicky. And um, I hope that uh, this uh, discussion has been of interest uh, or as an impulse for other people who, because the work of, of fighting the social structure or the racist structure cannot be done by just two people. We need, course, to have, yeah. we need to have a dynamic of people who are coming out braving enough to actually have such discussions, to yeah. write different narratives of our stories again. Yeah. So um, I'm hoping that um, this particular session is going to be an impulse for others to also get different ideas because it doesn't have to work the way we are doing it. People can, you know, you can fight the, the, the battle on different angles with different yeah. tools. So I'm yeah. looking forward to also hearing or also co-collaborating co with other people with their other different formats of uh, fighting the, the structure of racism. So thank you very much that you were here today. Uh, we are going to leave our, our links so that people can contact us via our websites, via our Facebook pages yeah. at the end of the video. And most of all, if it was a video and you like these conversations, please share it, comment. We like to get back your feedback because it's only then that we're going to be improving. Yes, that's right. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. Um, yeah. It's been nice. Uh, I know I uh, kind of said I wouldn't stay long, but it's been interesting enough. Um, and Jill, if you're still there, are you there? I'm still here, yes. I've been Hi. listening throughout. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, I hope to talk to you sometime. Uh, I need to come off now, but uh, it was nice to engage with you. Just as a note, um, I really need to educate myself regarding Liverpool's story. I wasn't aware about it. I'm so shocked. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I have to read more about it because the whitewashing of the English has really made me believe that they actually were against sla slavery, whereby they were really <laughs> active participants. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm really shocked that I didn't know this part of the story. 